how much Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister, explained the crisis in the Eurozone. He said, governments, public debts and deficits are too high because their public sectors spend too much, getting too little and their economies lack competitiveness. That is why immediate fiscal consolidation and structural reforms in highly indebted countries are of the essence. Do you agree? Uh, no. I mean, there's... You can possibly, possibly make that argument for Greece a bit, but none of the other countries in trouble fit that story at all. And even Greece, it's really only a piece of the story. Uh, most of the countries we now think of as being the debtor countries did not have particularly high public debts before the crisis. They didn't have large deficits. It was all private sector overreach. And it's, you know, this is a, an astonishing reinterpretation. It's, you're taking what was actually a case of markets gone wild and you're saying, oh, it's all because of irresponsible governments, which is not what actually happened. Well, but in Europe and in particular in Germany, many people think it is indispensable that a state has to cut the expenditures and increase the taxes when the debt is too high that it cannot borrow any more on the market. For an ordinary German, this is a very usual argument. Right, and it's, I mean, you certainly, uh, you don't want to say that there's never anything to this, right? Governments do, in the end, have to live within their means. But the question is, when you have an economy where the fundamental problem, uh, well, Spain, Portugal, uh, Ireland, uh, th these are all countries where the fundamental issue was they had a housing bubble financed through the private sector, actually the German Landesbanken lending to Spanish Caja is feeding a bubble, and then it bursts, and then you have a budget deficit. Uh, is this really a case where the solution is simply to raise taxes and slash spending, or do we have to do something that, that actually helps the, the real economy recover? Well, but if they cannot borrow anymore on the market? Well, well this is the, so, but that's kind of an interesting story, right? We say, well, they can't borrow anymore on the market. Um, and it's true that for quite some time, the um, uh, lending from the, from the Troika has been the only access they've had to capital. But a funny thing has happened, you know, since, uh, since in the last year or so, um, the European Central Bank started doing its job. The ECB said, okay, we, have, we are not going to allow any panics in the market. We're going to stand by whatever it takes, the famous phrase from Draghi. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the borrowing costs came way down. So look at Spain, which doesn't have a Troika program. Uh, um, Spain now has about the same, at, at the time we're doing this interview, Spain has about the same borrowing costs as Britain. Mm -hmm. You think that they're, they're you know, we, we still think of them as being no access to markets and they must do austerity, but they actually are now able to borrow money actually historically cheaply. It's probably, I think this is the lowest uh, borrowing cost Spain has ever had. And they didn't do that by balancing their budget. They didn't do that through austerity. They did it because the ECB has stabilized the markets, which says, well, you know, then what was all of this pain about? Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Well, the pain... You say it was a pain. For example, mainstream economists in Germany and, and the German and even the French government, they say uh, it's necessary to regain the confidence on the, of the markets to, to save and cut and raise taxes. Well, the interesting thing is that we actually have seen the confidence of the markets return, but not because of, the, of those programs, but because the, the, basically countries are, that don't have their own currency markets can get very nervous because they worry what if they run out of money as long as the central bank is ready there to uh, to supply yes. the uh, you know to say that they you will not run out of money you may be not guaranteeing about the cost but you won't run out of money then the problem largely went away and look at look at the united states look at britain uh, countries that continue to have budget deficits ran very large deficits during the worst time have never had a problem with with market confidence. So this is, it. You know, actually, I, I would say what's really happening is that a lot of officials, uh, especially in, in Brussels, uh, they, they, they talk about market confidence, but they don't really mean the confidence of the market. They mean confidence from me. I, you know, it's, uh, someone sits there uh, in, in Brussels, wants to see government spending cut, and says, you must do this to satisfy the market. But what he really means is, I want it. And so I'm going to, I'm going to claim that I'm speaking for the markets, but I'm really speaking for myself. But these austerity measures, yeah. cuts in expenditures in particular, cuts in pension payments and so on, what was the result of that for, for the European economy? 
Well, you, there's a dramatically clear correlation between austerity and economic downturns. The, uh, uh, basically, it, it seems that every, every euro in, in tax increases or, or more important spending cuts, every euro in spending cuts seems to, uh, on average, have cost uh, around 1.3 or 1.5 euros of, of gross domestic product. Um, and so, so the, the economy just even, shrunk. Even worse. Well, they certainly made the economy shrink. Sure, no, the the, the negative, you know, the, before the crisis, before the austerity took effect, it was possible, I guess, to claim that austerity would actually be good for the economy, that it would uh, that that it would be a positive effect. There were there were people making that argument, but now we have, you know, now we have experience, and it's overwhelmingly the case, overwhelmingly the case that that austerity, in fact, uh, does cause economies to shrink, um, and it causes them to shrink by more than one for one. Uh, another way to say this, which is actually quite important, is if you think that government cuts um, make it free up money so that the private sector can spend, it doesn't work that way. What we've actually seen is that when the government cuts, the private sector pulls back as well. So there's actually been a, a, a fall in private as well as, as public spending in the austerity countries. And what we have seen in many countries is that already before the private sector and the private households had to reduce their spending because they were indebted as well. That's uh, right. So all three sectors at the same time try to save money. Huh? Yeah, they, what people find very hard to understand, if I may say what Germans seem to find particularly hard to understand, um, is that the economy is a circle, right? Uh, money flows around. Uh, uh, you buy from me, I buy from you. My spending is your income, your spending is my income. If you say, well, people must spend less, uh, if everybody spends less at the same time, then incomes fall. So when you say, uh, where well, we're going to, the private sector we know is, is over indebted, it's having to cut back, and we're saying, okay, now the public sector also has to cut back, uh, who is supposed to, you know, who are we selling to? Uh, where, where is, the, this, this cannot work if everyone does it at the same time. This sounds very plausible, but why then, in spite of this clear evidence you, you, you cite, why then it is done? It's difficult to understand. If it's easy to be seen that it won't work, why they do it? Well, first of all, uh, the experience of people take their own experience. This, this, uh, let, let me, this is a happy, or uh, this is at least a, a forgiving uh, version of what happened. Uh, Germany looks at its experience and says, well, we did austerity in 1999, 2000. We, Germany was actually kind of a troubled economy in the late 1990s, and um, it pulled back, and Germany is doing fine now. And so why can't everyone else do the same? And of course, to, the, to that, the answer is, well, Germany was doing okay because it was able to run massive trade surpluses. And it was able to run massive trade surpluses because there was this great debt financed boom in places like Spain. And uh, now Germany is saying to Spain, you do what we did, but we won't do what you did. We're, we're, you know, it's not mm -hmm. But, but you know, Germany, just looking at its own experiences, thinks that austerity works, not realizing that the context matters. Um, then there's a lot of, uh, a, a, there's a lot of values there's a lot of ulterior motives, I think is the right way to put this. There are a lot of people who are uh, determined that uh, they want to impose, they, they want the welfare state to shrink, they want smaller programs, they, they, uh, there's a kind of moralizing thing or just a political priority. And you can see that some of the people who were very adamant about the importance of balancing budgets when France did a lot of austerity but did it mainly through tax increases, they said, oh no, that's not good has to be spending mm -hmm. cuts, and it turns out, okay, so you weren't, aren't really worried about budget deficits, you just want to shrink the welfare state. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, so that's, that was a false pretenses. Um, and finally, of course, you know, arithmetic is not, uh, is not the strong suit of many politicians. Uh, I may say that things have to add up, that we can't all run trade surpluses, but that's not the way a because lot of people Marsh think. Because Marsh isn't buying. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's, well, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the, but just the, just the notion that uh, that you know, things ha adding up, just the fact that things have to add up, that my, sell you know, my income is, it comes from selling to you and your income from, comes from selling to me, um, that is not an easy concept for people who think in slogans to grasp.
So that means that the argument about excessive spending is only an excuse to impose policies which favor the rich or the banks or the I capital think, owners? I, I think you have to be, you have to have a, an appropriate degree of cynicism here. I don't think there are a lot of people who are very clearly in their minds saying, I'm going to have a fake argument so that I can serve my priorities. Uh, but you have a lot of people who, ad who choose arguments that really don't make sense because they fit their priorities. So I, I, I don't think that there's, it's exactly there's a conspiracy to destroy the economy of Spain to serve the interests of German banks and, and the wealthy. Um, but there are people who want to uh, support the interests of the wealthy and of German banks who are thereby drawn to theories that lead to, to disaster in Spain. Uh, my, my impression is often when I meet these representatives of what is called in German mainstream economy, uh, my impression is they really believe in their arguments. That's and right. They, and, and when you say, but look at, at the evidence, look at, at the empiric figures we have, uh, it doesn't work, then, then suddenly they react as if you have tried to, to convict them or something like that. We, ha we have a lot of, actually, we have a lot of evidence from uh, uh, psychological and sociological studies that say that uh, when someone has strong beliefs um, evidence doesn't change their mind and in fact the better informed they are the more resistant they are to evidence uh, so we, it's not too surprising and it's very 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 moralistic people have a, a set of values and they if you say but those values don't make sense in terms of multiplication and, and adding and subtracting they just get angry they don't actually change their mind what do you mean by moralistic Oh, it's debt is debt is bad. Debt is evil. Uh, as, as a, of course, as as an English speaker, I do wonder a little bit whether the fact that uh, that that in German "schuld" means both debt and guilt, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, is is a factor. But no, just in general, the the notion that debt is a bad thing, and the notion that it's always the debtor. Without debt, there is no capitalism. Well, you, yes, debt, of course, is part of how we function. But also, what I find really striking is that all of the responsibility is placed on the debtor. So look at, look at Spain, uh, it's, it's, it, which is actually the easiest case because it's, there was, Spain had low government debt. But the so same we, in Ireland. Right. And so there you have, con but you have um, mostly real estate lending, irresponsible real estate lending which is undertaken by Spanish banks, usually Cajas. Uh, where do they get the money? They borrow from banks in other countries, actually, especially from Germany. So you have a German Landesbank lends money through the wholesale market to a Spanish Caja, which lends money to a real estate developer. And then disaster, because it turns out that was overextended. Um, certainly the real estate developer is at fault. Certainly the Spanish Caja is at fault, but isn't also the the Landes pocket fault. All of these people were, were making loans without thinking about it very carefully. And, but now all of the burden, all of the cost is falling on Spain, none on anybody else. Do you want to know what Mr. Schäuble answered when I have put this question to yeah? him in, for the last film? Okay. I presented him in, in a quote from an interview with the president of a Spanish Caja. He, who explained to us how easy it was to get money from Germany. Yeah. They didn't even ask us where we would do the money. And then Mr. Schäuble answered, well, but we have not forced them with violence to take our money. That was his only answer. No, that's, <laughs> yes, About right. the co-responsibility of the investor. Right, that's, uh, the, the, and the point, of course, is that normally if somebody makes a, a loan without checking what they're doing, then when things go bad, you expect the lender to take some loss as mm -hmm. well. And what's happening is that only the, only the Spanish public and, uh, and well, basically only the Spanish public is paying the cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, it's a very, uh, well, it's a bad, it's a bad situation and, um, and destructive. You know, in the end, there's a European interest in having this work out. And so it's, it's a destructive thing for all, everybody concerned. Mm -hmm. Now some questions to the, to the Troika programs yeah. itself, to the so-called rescue yeah. programs. When the creditor countries in spring 2010 imposed draconian austerity program on Greece with cuts in expenditures and tax increases of 18% of GDP right. in three years, 
it led to an e economic catastrophe in, in Greece and the highest number of unemployed since Great Depression. Couldn't this have been predicted? Yeah, it was in fact predicted, although it's, it's interesting. The, uh, if you go back to what people were saying in the spring of, of 2010, uh, you had, uh, well we know that the of, the, of the three members of the Troika, so you had uh, the European Commission and the ECB were both believing that spending cuts will actually expand the economy. They were, going, they were endorsing the doctrine of expansionary austerity. Um, you can find Trichet, uh, the, the then president, Jean-Claude Trichet, saying uh, it is incorrect to say that this will have a mm -hmm. contractionary effect on the economy. You can find the European Commission holding uh, symposia to, uh, to celebrate the economists who were claiming that it would be expansionary. Um, only the IMF was saying, well, it will be contractionary. But even they were grossly understating the negative impact. And uh, they, they have now admitted that. They, they were looking at the historical evidence wrong. So everyone went in with this positive view. Uh, of course, I use the phrase, they, believing in the confidence fairy, mm -hmm. believing that that this, that this would somehow be positive. Um, but if you should have known, it, it was clearly just not right. It, the historical evidence, the logic of it all said that, that it was very unlikely that this would, you'd be able to do this kind of contraction without severe economic cost. And sure enough, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Today, many Greeks believe that it should have been predicted and it had been predicted what happened later. Yeah. And now they believe that they, they have been sort of a guinea pigs in, in a big experiment. What happens to a society when you do it this way? Yeah. Um, has it been an experiment? Well, it wasn't intended as an experiment, but sure, in effect, we've had a gigantic natural experiment of uh, extreme austerity programs in some countries. Uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, if, if there was any lingering doubt about the effect of, of sharp spending cuts on economies, we now know the answer, which is that it's extremely negative. Um, yeah, now it, it's an interesting question to ask what, what, what would or could the Troika have done differently? And I think there probably, it was unavoidable that there would be some austerity, uh, but nothing on, like on this scale. Uh, if you ask of that 18 points of GDP cut, mm -hmm. uh, if you needed some move towards, towards smaller deficits, uh, you know, maybe uh, a few points of GDP, but not 18. And that was, how, how much did that actually enhance Greece's position? And the answer almost surely is not at all. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, it's been incredibly destructive. But that means the alternative would have been to lend even more money to Greece to stretch the period for, ad for adjustment? You wanted to have um, more lending, although one of the things that's happened here is that because austerity has contracted the Greek economy so drastically, revenue has mm -hmm. fallen. And actually, and, and social insurance spending to the extent it still is preserved has gone up. So if Greece had done uh, half as much deficit reduction it would not have, it would have been a, it, it would have had a somewhat larger deficit, but not much larger. That this has been, you know, the, 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 the impact, the fiscal impact of the austerity has been much less in reducing deficits than you would expect because of the negative economic impact. So a more, a much milder austerity program would have required only slightly more money. And the prospects of the, of the, of the country would look a lot better right now. Mm -hmm. When we talk to former Greek ministers, yeah. they tell us that they often had the feeling that the other side, you know, the representatives yeah. of, the, of the Troika institutions, that they ha wanted to punish them well, for, for having, having behaved bad before or something like that. They, f they really felt punished, yes. uh, not, not helped, yeah, not rescued. Yeah, Greece was, was well, I was about to say Greece was singled out, but actually what Portugal has faced has been not so much better. I mean, it's, it's not as severe as Greece, but it's also very severe. And mm -hmm. sure, it's, there's, there was a clear sense that we're going to have to be really, really harsh on them and, and uh, partly as a lesson to others. And, um, and again, what's interesting now is now 
Greek borrowing costs, they're still high, but they've fallen drastically. And the reason is, again, not because the markets have concluded that they're financially oh, sound. But that is still but, unsustainable. Right, but, the, but because the European Central Bank has, has made it clear that there will not be a cash shortage. So if the goal was to bring down the borrowing costs, the austerity was mostly unnecessary. All that we, it, there's no reason really why the ECB couldn't have done in, in 2010 what it finally got around to doing in, in, in 2012 and 2013. Oh yes, there is a reason. Well, of course, politically, <laughs> but it's... No, no, uh, they had another president. It was Mr. Trichet. Ah, yes. Well, and he has a completely different analysis. Yeah, that's right. Well, situation. In, uh, in, in 2010, uh, no, there's you know, remarkable interviews with Trichet. By the way, I know he's a, a very likable man. I, you know, I know I know him reasonably well. But, mm. but he really bought into the notion that uh, that austerity would restore confidence and and everything would be well, and was very reluctant. But then it's not just the, the one man. It's also uh, you have to bring along the board. Mm -hmm. So you, it took it took a, not just a change of president, but. Uh, some extraordinary diplomacy. You know, I'm a, I'm a great admirer of, of Mario Draghi, who I think has has not done everything I would like, but has done more than I thought he was going to be able to. But clearly, in 2010, you had neither the man nor the the, uh, the context to do that. But in in retrospect, three years of of horror that were really gratuitous. Mm -hmm. There's one element in the programs which even Mr. Draghi supports very strongly, yeah. and that is this radical liberalization of labor markets. Yeah. Uh, all limits to dismiss dismissals were abolished, uh, severance payments were cut to nearly zero, collective bargaining was abolished as well, and, and by all these wages were cut up to 25% uh, in Greece. In, in, in Portugal it was 8 to 10%. And this should encourage the enterprises to create jobs, and the Troika officials always promised this, but in reality the opposite has happened. Okay, now here's, um, let me be a bit of a conventional economist for yeah, a moment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if you look at what happened during the period between 2000 and 2007, the good years, you did have large wage increases in the peripheral economies relative to the core. So you did have a lot of wage inflation not because anybody was behaving badly, but because you had booms. You had a, a huge housing boom and, uh, in Spain and to, to an important extent, a large consumer boom in Portugal. But didn't this only compensate for the inflation they had? No, no. It's actually, it, it, did, it actually did make them uncompetitive. Manufacturing in Spain was a lot less attractive by 20, 2007 than it was in 2000 because of the rise in wages. And you had to bring the relative wage back down. Um, but to say, first of all, that you need to do this by cutting wages in the periphery as opposed to raising them in the core, right? This, what we really need is we need rising wages in Germany, not, not falling wages in, in Spain. Uh, that's a much easier solution. But the other thing is all of these labor market reforms are supposed to create flexible wages. Nobody has flexible wages. No. Nobody. It, it never happens. It doesn't happen. It's just the, the idea that you're going to create a a labor market so flexible that, that wages fall easily so as to restore competitiveness after a, after a boom. That's not, nobody does that. The, um, if you look at private sector wages, aside from Greece, Greece is, has just had such a horror show that wages have been beaten down. But everyone else, uh, even Ireland, wages haven't really fallen. The United States, so I take countries that, that already have the structural reforms, right? The United States has a brutal labor market minimal collective bargaining, minimal protections for workers, wages never fall in the United States. It, you, just, you do not see wage cuts. Wage flexibility doesn't happen. Ireland, Ireland was praised before the crisis as having done wonderful structural reforms. I mean, I have friends, Irish economists, who joke about it, uh, bitter jokes, but they say people say that we must do structural reforms when there's a crisis, but we'd already done all the structural reforms. Maybe we should have not done the reforms before so we could do them when the crisis struck. But you know, in Ireland, wages don't fall. So the, the idea that through these structural reforms you're going to create this perfect classical labor market where wages are as flexible as the price of wheat, never going to happen. It doesn't happen anywhere. So it's, it's a pipe dream. All you're doing is, is removing a bunch of protections for ordinary workers. And the people there, they feel that the burden is 
is uh, distributed very unfair. Yeah? Sure. Yeah? Only the workers and the taxpayers, the ordinary taxpayers, they have to adapt, they have to pay, they have to, to live with less income and so on. But at the same time, the already privileged are even offered st valued state assets at bargain prices. Yeah, yeah well, this there's some of that. And there's, uh, yeah, I mean, Ireland, the, the government steps in to guarantee all of the debt of the banks. And what the debt of the banks uh, you know, was, First of all, a lot of that is, in fact, debt to you know, uh, other other European uh, banks. Uh, but also, what it was used for was <laughs> was all kinds of things. There, there's actually a, there's a there's an apartment building near where we're filming mm -hmm. um, uh, the uh, the uh, the Appsthorpe, which was a, a disaster. It was a they tried to do a condominium conversion, and uh, they they right into the middle of the crisis and, and the lender lost a lot of money and who was, who was actually providing the money? Turns out it was Anglo-Irish Bank. Oh. <laughs> so here you have it. So, so the Irish public is guaranteeing debt that was taken on, not even to speculate in Ireland, but to speculate in New York. You know, this is crazy. Yeah. Uh, so people are right to feel outraged. Very much so. Mm -hmm. And have you ever dealt with this privatization wave, which is included right. in these rescue programs? Right. Uh, yeah, and they, for example, in, in, in Greece, they have sold really valuable state assets. For example, in, in Athens, there is an, a large area, I see three, think three times bigger than Monaco, has been sold without any public auction. There was only yeah. one bidder. Well, this is, uh, this is, I have to say, this is actually kind of characteristic. This has been a story many times. But, but it yeah, has been covered by the, by the Troika. Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, again, a lot of these things, some, there are cases where the state owns things that would be better in private hands. You know, privatization is not always a bad thing. No, but no. clearly, a lot of was taken. There were a lot of fire sales that were really unnecessary. And if you, and, and some people made out, uh, uh, there, there, was a, there was a lot of private gain involved here. There, were, there was a lot in general of, um, uh, well, in English, we'd say heads I win, tails you lose. The, the risks, the, the, uh, um, the profits were privatized and, and the risks were socialized, or the losses were socialized. Do you know an explanation why the IMF and, and also the EU Commission and the ECB, why they are so keen on privatization, any kind of state asset? Well, there's, it's, there's a kind of, uh, I, I think it, there's a mixture of things. And I, I don't really know the European context uh, as, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know the people as well, but I know how this works here mm -hmm. in the United States, which is that the, um, uh, first of all, there's, there tends to be a, there's a, a strong anti-government ideology. It's an important part of all of our, uh, you know, they, it's an important element in politics uh, across the Western world. Uh, then there's the, the bankers have a lot of influence and some of it comes rather crudely from money they can spend on, on politics and from the revolving door where government officials then go off to work for banks. Um, but some of it just comes from the fact that bankers tend to be impressive people. They're mm -hmm. obviously very successful. They're very rich. They tend to be kind of smart. And you got a broom full of bankers, and they seem like men of the world who really know what should be done. And what they think should be done, surprise, is they think state assets should be privatized and banks should be guaranteed and very hard to swim against that. Very hard to have some labor leader or, uh, or some academic economist in his badly fitting suit, you know, argue against these very impressive people. So I think that's a lot of, of what went on. Thanks. Okay. The last part is about what to be done. Yeah. Um, now a huge part of, of Europe and in particular the Euro area is caught in nearly deflation or disinflation right. and, and stagnation. What can be done to overcome this dire situation and to bring down the unemployment? Uh, right. So uh, the, the, the Europe has a very difficult problem because the euro, the single currency, is a, is a straitjacket. It's, a, it's, it's very confining in terms of the alternatives. And yet nobody is willing to break it up or leave it. Uh, so you have to ask what can be done within that. I would say that what you need is, first and foremost, you, well, first you need the, the ECB to keep doing what it's doing. 
the ECB has to be standing behind the debts. You've got to keep those interest rates down. It's, it, you, you, that period, now, now that we know how much of it was just a panic, uh, the, the period when, when Spain and, and Italy and were, were paying 6 7% to, to borrow was totally unnecessary, producing a lot of, of deflationary impact that wasn't necessary. So the ECB needs to be in there keeping those, those borrowing costs down. The ECB also needs to do something to get Europe as a whole uh, expanding and, and it needs to get inflation up. There's no way that this is, there will be no exit. Uh, this will go on for decades if the European inflation rate is 0.5%. Because if it's 0.5% in the aggregate, that means destructive deflation in, in the periphery. Why is it so destructive? Well, think about it. The, you have, actually there's two different, at least two things. One is that falling, uh, it's very difficult to cut wages. So you're having a very hard time. The, the lack of competitiveness remains because it's rest restoration of competitiveness depends on wage cuts, which are very difficult to achieve. And then on top of that, you have debt. The debt is fixed in euro terms. If, uh, if incomes are not growing because you have deflation, then the debt situation gets worse. So the, if, if Europe had 2.5% inflation or 3% inflation, the situation would look vastly better than it with half a percent inflation, which is what it now has. So we, you need not, you know, not hyperinflation, just even, even to get back to a 2% inflation rate, which is the, more or less the official target, would do wonders for the overall this picture. This is, for many Germans, difficult to understand. I know, but it's... <laughs> uh, because, you know, they say already, now the interest rates are so low, uh, the savers are expropriated. Yeah? Uh, uh, the interest rates are below inflation rate, and uh, what, what's going to happen with our old age uh, what is, uh, savings and so on? So it's an interesting thing. If the market says that wages in Greece must fall, well, then wages in Greece must fall. If the market says that German savers can't get a good interest rate on their deposits because there isn't enough investment demand, that's an outrage. The government must do something about it. So, so this, is, this is a very much a double standard. And very clearly, everything is pointing to the fact that Europe really needs low interest rates and higher inflation. Uh, and if you say, well, you know, we want what do return you really does that offer? This, this would increase investment? It would help. And it would certainly, uh, yeah, sure, it would, it, would, it would increase investment. In, in, you know, if someone is given a choice between uh, letting money sit in a, in a bank account where it actually loses value or putting it into something real, uh, then you are encouraging them to put it into something real. So no, it would increase investment. But this in situation we already have, and in spite of it, investment is still going down, not up. Well, but the, the, the interest rates are still uh, not low enough. I mean, it, it, if you think about um, uh, compare it with the United States, uh, where we have higher inflation and the same low interest rates, and uh, we, we are, we're not doing great, but we're doing better. And it's at least in, to an important extent because of that. And the, the crucial thing is you just try to make the numbers work. Try to tell a story about how this ends with a return to something like an acceptable level of employment in Southern Europe without a higher inflation rate. It's not going to happen. With 0.5 for Europe as a whole, this is just an impossible situation. Then, of course, if, if, if I'm moving down my list, then I say on top of that, Germany should be uh, pursuing expansionary policies. Germany is, uh, somebody in Europe has to be spending. So Germany should not be doing austerity. Uh, some other countries also, actually. Uh, Germany is, is the biggest, which makes it the most important, but what, basically what the hell is the Netherlands doing? Mm -hmm. Very low borrowing costs, actually a quite weak economy, and yet more and more austerity. So they, they should be expanding as well. But our finance minister recently just said that he's proud of being the first finance minister since 30 years without any additional credit taking. Yes, yeah? well, it's a disaster. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complete misconception of what the problem is. And, you know, Germany, if you're going to share a currency with other people, then there is some shared responsibility. And it's, it runs both ways. It's not just that countries that are in deficit should do something about that, but that countries uh, that are in surplus 
have some responsibility as well. So we, what's, what's happening right now is the euro, this is, by the way, classic. This is, the, this is why uh, we needed the Bretton Woods system after World War II, because we had a, you don't want a system where if a country is running a trade surplus, it feels perfectly happy doing that. But if a country is running a trade deficit, then they have to cut because that creates a bias that all you have is cuts. It's a, it's a deflationary world. That is Europe today. And Germany is not accepting its responsibility to be on the other side, to be, uh, to be doing part of the adjustment as well. What would it mean to accept responsibility? What could the government do? Germany should be doing, at the moment, public investment. Germany Credit has, based. What? Credit based. That's right. Germany should be, uh, there, there are certainly things worth doing. You don't, if we had a European government, right, a real European government, then why I would say, well, let's have a federal infrastructure program in Europe. We don't, so the, we at least have to have the, the surplus countries, above all Germany, doing something uh, along the same lines. Now, I know it's not going to happen, but we just need to say this is, this is what ought to be happening. What we have now is a situation where everyone is trying to cut at the same time, and that's leading to a, a, a very impossible situation for, for much of the continent. There is a proposal by your colleagues, uh, Janos Varifakis and, and uh, Mr. Galbraith, saying that it could be done via the European Investment Bank. Uh, the European Investment Bank should raise f money yeah. uh, via Euro bonds or European bonds, which could be bought by the European uh, Central Bank. And this money could be used to finance a whole European infrastructure program. Sure. Someone would have to backstop so that would over that would circumvent the German problem. Yeah? Ah, but Germany, you know, in the end, uh, you know, infrastructure doesn't pay for itself. So you're going to have to have someone standing behind to, to back those bonds. Mm -hmm. So it would, in fact, be... Uh, in part also the German text. Right. Yeah. Now, I'm sure, I, I, I mean, it, that, of course, that would be a major step towards actually having a European government. In mm -hmm. effect, you'd be saying, okay, we have a European investment fund, which is backed by taxpayers across the whole European Union, and it's going to be spending, uh, I mean, it's, it, it would be exactly right. Uh, I have to say that you know, we have proposals for something like that in the United States as well, that we should have an infra infrastructure investment bank yes. that with a government uh, backing. And, and although we already have a central government, and it's politically impossible here. So we, you know, I talk about with, with people in, in, you know, in, in the Obama administration, they, they say, you know, we understand this is a great idea. Forget about it. It's not going to happen. So it's even harder in the European context. But sure, it's, again, you know, Europe created... Uh, single currency, single economy in many ways, without the structures that make that work. And things have gotten a bit better in the past year, mainly because at least one piece, the central bank, is starting to behave like a European institution, finally. But, in but order we need to, more. In order to save itself from destruction. That's right. <laughs> but, it's, it's, but all they've done, really, is they've bought time. And, uh, and the question is, will anybody make use of that time? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That was a great help. Okay, good. <laughs> good luck.